Early disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a professor like my uh, other panelists. So um, I've been an irrigation district manager for about 20 years. Uh, 15 of that, 16 of that has been with North Union Irrigation District in Central Oregon. Uh, prior to that, I managed a couple districts in Northern California and um, as most folks know, water and, and uh, politics in California are difficult to say the least. So I figured I'd scram and go to Oregon and have a happy 15, 20 year career, but it didn't quite work out that way. But uh, so I was I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to be able to, to go through a uh, habitat conservation plan as, as Gene uh, in your agenda um, chose. And I do have some perspectives and some other information that I think, I don't know that it will help folks, but it will inform folks. Uh, I know that the situation in climate, everybody, every basin is different. Every basin has their own issues, complexities, personalities, politics, um, you, know, you name it. Uh, we in the Chiefs Basin fortunately had a, 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 a very collaborative um, uh, working relationship with many of the people in the basin. You know, I'll show you a slide a little later, but really that was the, the premise and really the success of our, our program was to be able to have open, honest conversations. There weren't easy ones. Um, and they're, even today, they're not easy ones when uh, things change. But with that, I'll jump into my presentation. And again, I'll be around this arc. Um, really, the purpose of our HCP um, uh, was to um, get a permit under Section 10 of the ESA to allow for incidental take of listed species where such take uh, is the result of water management activities in the Deschutes Basin of Central Oregon. And I won't go over what tank is or what the incidental tank permit is. We heard uh, from Dave Philippi this morning and Mike Brennan also uh, talk about uh, um, those items. Section 10 uh, provides a pathway for compliance with the ESA for non federal entities like irrigation districts. Uh, in our case, the city of Pineville also joined us in the effort um, and pursuant to which they can develop a voluntary plan to minimize and mitigate their impacts to the species to the maximum extent practical. And that's right out of the uh, um, handbook. Uh, the Chief Basin HCP is a plan designed to do just that. And, um, uh, the HCP was a tremendous milestone, it was a historic event, um, again, over a decade to get done, and um, we're at the implementation stage now, um, and um, even today, every day is a challenge when we're trying to manage the water in our, in our base. Next, Gene. Vector background. I'm probably going to forget to tell you next. <laughs> you want the microphone so you can walk around? Um, well, I have some notes here. So uh, if you could jump to the next slide, I'll just try to remember to remind you. So the background, uh, Sheets Basin Irrigation Districts and the city of Prineville uh, labor is a, uh, is, uh, uh, um, it was much more laborious than just simply labor. 12 years developing the plan, and actually uh, the plan took longer than 12 years um, from the decision back to pursue an HCP to the time to actually finish. HCP was completed, completed and approved in 2020 by Fish and Wildlife Service and NEPS, who then issued incidental take permits to the district and the city of Pryderville, uh, providing take coverage for 30 years. So we have 26 years remaining on our incidental take permits for four years in the implementation. Meanwhile, Bureau of Reclamation completed a parallel section seven consultation, resulting in an incidental take statement. Uh, the Bureau's proposed actions adhered to and follow the lead 
of the district's conservation measures in the HCP. So essentially, we were the lead in the process along with Fish and Wildlife Service. And as others have alluded to, it allowed, it allowed us to chart our own destination, destination versus allowing federal agencies to, to do that for us. Next slide. The covered parties or, uh, or applicants or permittees are other terms that are used for uh, the parties. They include the eight irrigation districts of Central Oregon, which are actually formed under the Deschutes Basin Board of Control. Uh, the Board of Control was formed in the late 90s um, as an opportunity to pool our resources as a group versus working individually. And the ACP is the perfect example of that, where we pulled the, resor pulled the resources of our eight irrigation districts to complete the ACP versus one-off districts going and working with the agencies, collaborators, stakeholders to complete it. Uh, we exchange other types of services. We own um, equipment, labor. Um, it's really been a, um, a key benefit to the irrigation districts in the basin as a whole. And the DDBC is represented um, locally um, through some of our uh, collaborative efforts. We have it's called the Deschutes Basin Water Collaborative. It's in process right now, and, and the DDBC represents essentially all eight irrigation districts in that forum, and it has so um, um, for decades now. The city of Prineville um, is not part of the DDBC, but it did, um, did decide to jump in with this uh, to pursue their incidental take permits. Uh, they, they withdraw groundwater. Uh, Crooked River runs right through this, the middle of the city, and I believe they also have some withdrawals from the Crooked River as well. So they wanted some protection as a city going forward, and um, so they joined on. We had offered the opportunity to other uh, cities, um, contractors, stakeholders, but um, this is, these are the folks that joined on and um, stuck it out. Next, Gene. The HCP covered species for Oregon spotted frog. I don't know if there's not a person that's involved with water in Oregon that hasn't heard about Oregon spotted frog. Bull trout is another one. Uh, steelhead currently designated as experimental, not essential under ESA Section 10J. Which wasn't mentioned much today, uh, but they will become fully listed uh, as threatened in 2025. Um, a note to that is we received um, uh, the 10J. No, uh, so we approached SNPs um, 12 years ago, told them we're going to go after HCP, and NIMPS said, okay, if you don't go down that road, go down that road. Uh, we'll provide you with a letter that says you're immune from um, prosecution or prosecutorial. Um, uh, again, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm at a loss of words there. In other words, we're, we won't be sued over the fact that we have still had so many more up our rivers and by our fish kids. And then lastly, sockeye salmon, uh, unlisted but could become listed during the 30 year term. And through this process, we had over 30 species that could be or would be or might be listed, but obviously we couldn't address all those. So we, we picked the, the main uh, species that are either threatened now or likely to be um, listed uh, in the future. And when we started the ACP, ACP was really a fish species focused ACP. Um, once the Oregon spotted frog was listed, the fish kind of got kicked to the curb and all our focus was on the Oregon spotted frog. And really what folks were saying, especially at the agency level, was, well, what's good for the frogs is good for the fish. And we are finding out that that's not exactly true in some cases. 
especially in the way the reservoirs and the rivers are operated now post uh, HCP. Next, HCP covered activities. So our activities um, include storage and release of water in nine reservoirs. I have a map on the next slide. Diversion of surface water at 18 primary diversions and over 80 small pumps. And those are usually uh, small uh, uh, riverside pumps. Uh, conveyance water to irrigated lands through more than a thousand miles of canals and pipes. Return of irrigation water to natural water rate, waterways and at multiple locations. And if you're a bit uh, familiar with um, Bureau of Reclamation projects, um, a lot of the, the systems in going into rivers uh, or streams. In this case, uh, for North Unit anyway, he's filling the Quicker River and uh, the Chief River as, as, um, as the tail end of our systems. So that's coming. And then for the city of Pineville, it was uh, municipal pumping of groundwater. And then meanwhile, the Section 7 uh, covered activities include uh, the rec reclamations actions related to the above. So their Section 7 actually covers those exact same uh, activities. Um, as I noted above. Next team. So this is a, a picture or a map of the Sheets Basin. We have uh, the covered lands, is a term used in, in the HCP, 340 miles of rivers and streams, 151,000 acres of irrigated farmland, and the Sheets Basin is about 10,000 square miles. And I don't know how well you can see it up there, but it, it stretches from uh, just south of Crescent Lake here in Klamath County, extends down to um, the north or up to the north and terminates at the Columbia River, runs west to the east slope of the Cascades and then um, goes east to uh, Crook County and uh, the Ocean Coast um, out in eastern Oregon. So a large uh, swath of land and a lot of um, a lot of um, infrastructure uh, that the HCP took into account and that and now that we're covered for. Next, Jim. So you probably hear me mention collaboration and collaborative process um, several times. And you can't do it without it. This is really a short list of the uh, participants in the process. Our, uh, um, our, our initial collaborative process or collaborative process had a huge amount of feedback. Yeah. The Sheep's Basin is a very interactive basin. The public is very interested in what the Basin Districts are doing, what's going on with the river, what's going on with the reservoirs. And so um, we started with a very large group. And as time went on, we had to whittle that group down because we had to start making some tough decisions. And with 50 people sitting around the table, it's hard to do that. So we went the down to the irrigation districts and Fish and Wildlife Service, NIMPS, and Bureau of Reclamation at the end of the day. Those were the decision makers. We were the decision makers. So that's where we landed. <clears throat> confederated, confederated tribes of Warm Springs also were part of that process and, and are engaged today. We have a very good working relationship with our tribal members to the north. And uh, um, that's no easy task. It takes a lot of effort and energy to, um, to um, nurture and keep those relationships positive going forward. Because our interests don't always align with their interests, but at the same time, we both have interests in the basin and it's good to have partners uh, like the, the tribes of Warm Springs. Crook County was a part, as was uh, the Chutes and Jefferson counties. And then we had uh, a laundry list of non governmental organizations or NGOs. Um, and again, this is a short, short list of the folks that were most involved in the process. 
uh, might be worth noting at the time we're developing these, you were also in the middle of a basin study. Uh, basin study uh, was funded by uh, the Bureau of Reclamation and the state of Oregon. And it was a, it's a precursor to a much larger um, effort, uh, integrated water, uh, integrated water resource strategy that uh, the state is um, advocating. So we began that work, uh, again, a large number of um, basin interests and that actually helped feed into the HCP and was providing some information from the HCP and um, um, the process as well. Next, Gene. Timeline and funding. So the ACP development began in 2009, and actually, as I mentioned before, um, 2007 was the time we actually decided to pursue an ACP. Um, 2008 was uh, requests for proposals went out for ACP contractors. Uh, we selected a contractor, and during 2008 year, uh, that we worked with that contractor to develop the ACP team which were subcontractors of our, our um, main CP consultant for contract. We had uh, draft conservation measures presented in 2017. Uh, NEPA process began in 2017, concluded in 2020. That was a, a $1.6 million process that many weren't too pleased with uh, uh, based on the cost, but also some of the the outcomes of it. Uh, public review of, of the EIS and ACP uh, was 2019 and 2020. The public review process generated over 1,500 comments. Um, so some poor associate and law firm had to pour through the 1,500 comments, categorize them, and develop responses to them. So. Hopefully they weren't new, and hopefully if they were, they're still with the firm after that. Our efforts were supported by seven federal grants, totaling 3.3 million. Um, those federal grants were through Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I believe there are section six grants. And then as with grants, there's matching funds and any kind of contributions that we provided of, of 3.4 million as well. And uh, uh, our timeline um, kind of hit a uh, snag. Halfway through the process, um, the Bureau of Reclamation was sued by Center for Biological Diversity for their failure to um, consult, as um, I think Mike Brennan was um, talking about earlier. Uh, and not long after that, there was another suit filed by an Oregon NGO that I will name here. And uh, they're actually a collaborator in our process, but they sued the districts, the irrigation districts that were part of the gates, um, the issue space and border control, and then also uh, the Bureau of Reclamation. And those, that lawsuit was basically um, under, I believe, Section 9 of the ESA where they were claiming our operations and our work were, were um, involved in tank, and uh, therefore that was the reason they were coming after us. Eventually both lawsuits were joined, we ended up in federal court, and we actually won, which uh, um, is, as the Lindy mentioned earlier, is not very common when um, you're in types of legal battles. Uh, we won the law. We won the lawsuit largely in part because of the support of the Confederate of Warm Springs and also U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, they both testified on our behalf um, in federal court in support of the UCP. And um, really, the judge's ruling boils down to: you guys have a great collaborative process going. There are several years in your HCP. I'm going to dismiss these and you guys go finish your HCP. If you don't finish your HCP by this date, we'll see you back there in court. So 
Luckily, we finished the HCP and there was a settlement agreement that was reached after the fact that it was kind of, kind of neat at that point because we had already started conservation measures related to the HCP to show that we were moving in the right direction with um, completion of an HCP. Next slide, Gene. Our conservation approach. On the Crooked River, utilize uncontracted water in Prineville Reservoir for maximum benefit to fish and wildlife. Back in 2014, there was um, legislation, federal legislation that was passed that allocated a uh, $155,000, $155,000 acre reservoir that hadn't been fully allocated. Um, about half of it had been allocated to irrigation, and the other half was kind of um, um, slash fund for um, oper um, operations. It's, it's a it's a mineral reclamation reservoir, Army Corps of Engineers involved, and it's a flood control reservoir. So there's a lot of uh, fingers in the pie in that particular reservoir. And of course, the next Congress to reallocate uh, the reservoir storage. Augmented stream flows when uncontracted, uncontracted water is not enough. And these are um, these past few years are a perfect example of that. During the drought, there was not enough uncontracted water to be placed in the Crooked River. So as part of the HCP, the other contractors with the contracted water in the reservoir had to make up that difference. And that's that really when we put the HCP together wasn't supposed to happen that often, but we knew we were going to end up in a historic drought for five, six years. So that actually came into play. <clears throat> White Chiefs Creek, complete piping of the entire Three Sisters Irrigation District to eliminate seepage losses and increase stream flow. <clears throat> Three Sisters Irrigation District was actually nearly done piping their district uh, when we completed the HCP. It got a little more to go, but uh, for the most part, their entire district is now piped and pressurized and um, probably a 25 year process. Uh, the manager there has, has been very proactive and uh, now they're completely piped. They have a couple of hydroelectric facilities within their uh, district. Um, their, their patrons have pressurized water and it's really been a, a great success story for Three Sisters Irrigation District. And, Quite honestly, the model we will follow there in each, each case. And then it gives priority to industry water rights at times of, of no natural flow. Okay. Next, Gene. Continue with conservation approach. The upper shoots in Crescent Creek. And if you have any questions on Crescent Creek, I have a, a fellow district manager in the back here. And if I run into trouble, he's gonna help me out. So <laughs> with that being said, uh, um, a lot of the, the a lot of the effort uh, was focused on storage and storage reservoirs in the upper Deschutes Basin, including Crescent Lake that uh, Chris uh, is responsible for. But uh, one of the one of the um, conservation measures is hold water in Crane Prairie, which is above Wiki Up Reservoir, to protect and enhance one of these spotted frog habitat within the reservoir. And that's uh, actually become a Oregon spotted frog strong. Uh, the management of that reservoir has uh, changed from a, a wide variety of elevations in the reservoir to a very small one. And, and as such, the Oregon spotted frog has flourished in that particular reservoir. Uh, for Wiki Up, again, reduce irrigation storage in the reservoir uh, to protect and enhance Oregon spotted frog habitat downstream from the Deschutes River. And that's accomplished by um, uh, releasing winter flows and we would be typically storing water uh, for the benefit of the Oregon spotted frog. Wiki Up Reservoir doesn't have a lot of frog habitat uh, or frogs 
around the perimeter or falling within um, what you can have rooms for. Then again, reduce irrigation storage and crept lake reservoir to protect and enhance uh, habitat downstream in Crescent Creek and the Little Shoots River. Again, um, the operations of, of Crescent Lake and Crescent Creek and Little Deschutes um, has all changed. The way we used to do stuff for 70 years or longer um, has all changed. Um, and we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're still learning every day on how to implement and manage the HCP. One of the, the bigger and more costly um, conservation measures reduce canal you know, seepage losses through piping and increase on farm efficiency to compensate for losses to reservoir storage. Um, we've been very successful in the Shoots Basin um, obtaining federal funding to do just that. We've been uh, piping, um, in fact, Christmas district is, is nearly piped. Um, piping districts to save the water. And I don't know if I can I'll try to explain this. So if, um, if Chris pipes a ditch in his district and saves 10 CFS, North Unit releases 10 CFS of water in the winter in exchange for receiving Chris's 10 CFS as life load in the summer. So it's an exchange process that we've worked out throughout the districts and Really, that's how we're going to accomplish our goals and try to meet uh, some pretty lofty goals when it comes to river flow in the Upper Deschutes, uh, in the Upper Deschutes River. And then there was also a uh, time lapse to complete piping projects. Uh, many of you in the room probably know what it takes to uh, find the funding to, to put the projects in place to get the projects done. It takes a lot of time. Personally, Fish and Wildlife Service recognized that and really us uh, a little more time than they might to try and accomplish uh, getting those projects done and um, help to start meeting those, those timelines um, within the HCP. And we have benchmark increases in industry flows in years eight and 13 of the HCP. And we started a hard CFS and brought up to as much as four or 500 CFS. Next, Gene. Challenges. Meeting optimal flow and water temperature targets for steelhead. Again, those are mostly in the crooked, uh, which is Hill Creek and the Pine Creek on the Crooked River system and then Y2 Street, which is out by Sissy, Oregon. Crooked River is notoriously known for um, warm water, particularly during the, the summer, it runs over, uh, the river runs over the salt. Salt's heated during the summer, it's um, lined by canyon walls, the heat reflects off and it's, it's not a very, uh, not a very cool or, um, or a cool river for species that, that are cold water species. Um, balancing reservoir and riverine habitats for Oregon spotted frog with irrigation events. Upper Deschutes River, as I mentioned, in Crescent Creek. Um, just the, as I mentioned, everything basically has been turned upside down. Um, we used to be able to manage reservoirs, I won't say willy nilly, but based on the need. So, our irrigation district is the demand system. Our farmers call in at 5 p.m. I need X number of CFS for X number of days. We tally all that up and release it um, out of WikiUp Reservoir for our farmers. Well, that's not so simple anymore. We still take the orders, we still uh, request the demand, but now reservoirs have to stay at certain elevations for certain periods of time. The river below WikiUp Reservoir can't fluctuate by certain amounts during certain times of the year. So if the Oregon spotted frog is breeding in some location and there's water in there, we can't drop the river level and dry up those frogs or the breeding habitat. Likewise, if they bred and their eggs are out in an oxbow or a wetland, we can't really increase the flows or decrease because that will 
dislodged the eggs become available for predators or you know, flush downstream or, or whatever the case may be. So short story is our operations, um, although manageable for the most part, have become much more difficult uh, in the basin. And then funding canal, non farm efficiency projects, again, that's a uh, given. Um, we've been able to bring in about $150 million to the basin to do piping projects and on farm efficiency. Many of you have heard of PL566. It's been our bread and butter for a while now, and hopefully, I did see it get funded uh, after the, the last budget approval, but not nearly to the level. Um, that we would like to see, and then also the state of Oregon has actually stepped up and, and put $50 million of lottery bonds into a bucket of money for irrigation districts to do um, irrigation modernization projects. Next, progress state, as I mentioned, we're in year four. Green Prairie and Green being operated to enhance the uh, Oregon spotted frog habitat. Upper Deschutes River mineral flow in, in winter has increased to 100 CFS from 20 CFS, which was our, our legal limit prior to the HCP. I mean, other words, you, know, you, you can imagine 20 CFS in the Upper Deschutes um, all the way down to the mouth of the Columbia isn't a lot of water. Um, so people were ecstatic when they saw 100 CFS, and now we're at about 145 CFS today. And CYD, Arnold Irrigation District, Old Pine Irrigation District have um, uh, projects underway, and we expect to see that number hopefully around 200 or more within the next couple of years. Crescent Lake is being operated in enhance Morgan's Spotted Frog Habitat again. Uh, reservoir levels and the releases out of the, the reservoir to maintain flows in Crescent Creek and the Lower Deschutes River. Piping of district canals is underway throughout the basin. I mentioned that, and um, some of our smaller districts are actually nearly done piping their uh, entire district. And again, it goes back to PL566, and you know part of part of this process and and having HCP. It's easy for us to go back to Washington, D.C. and say, hey, it's been 12 years working on this. These, this is our plan. These are our conservation measures. We literally need billions of dollars to put pipe in the ground. And fortunately, our legislators have listened. PL 566 was a program that sat dormant for 10 or 12 years when your marks went away, but it's been a program that's been around for well, since the 40s and had billions of dollars run through it. So Senator Markley was able to, working with a senator from Kentucky, I believe, uh, did some horse training and was able to get that program refunded and has been able to keep it funded for, for several years now. So again, that's really our bread and butter. And you know, I'd encourage the districts that are in the room or others to look at PL 566 as a, a means to um, Put pipe in the ground if that's something you want to do. And I mentioned the uncontracted storage in Pineville Reservoir will now be used to uh, benefit fish and wildlife. And then City of Pineville's Cricket River Wetland Creation or Wetland Complex, they call it, is operating uh, with potential for additional phases. And this is really, they were well on their way to completing the, the wetland complex and there's actually a picture of it before the HCP started. And this is actually, it's um, gained national recognition. It's won numerous awards. Um, it's become a model for cities around the state and really around the nation to be able to uh, put a complex like this together that treats um, their city's wastewater naturally versus um, that big U-shaped thing there to the right was their original pond. And what started this was they uh, had to upgrade their facility 
population took off in Crook County and the system they had couldn't, um, couldn't uh, take care of all the, uh, the wastewater. So they were looking at us, I think it was $62 million mechanical treatment facility. Well, Pine Mills, seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 residents. And obviously you can't pass $62 million worth of wastewater treatment onto a, a community like that. So they came up with this idea. And again, it's, it's um, very clever. Um, it's, um, like I say, it, it, I don't know that it's one of a kind, but it's gotta be, uh, there can't be a lot of these out there. So if you're interested, uh, there's actually a website, uh, Crooked River wetlandscomplex.com or something like that. But if you just Google Crooked River Wetlands Complex, there'll be more information there than you probably care to so this was a big piece of meeting there, um, HCP um, requirements. Yeah, next team, coming down to the end. Lessons learned, benefit one, HCP process enabled districts to better control their own destinies. Um, as we've heard before, districts led to scientific studies and conservation concepts. And we are leading implementation of conservation measures identified in the HCP. I have to say, sounds like we came up with uh, conservation measures or concepts and fish and wildlife, and everybody agreed to it. No, that's the farthest from the case. We spent 12 years negotiating basically water in our basin. So it was uh, a lot of give and take, and um, um, at the end, we had a, a sign at that conservation plan and incidental take permits issue. Uh, benefit two, HCP provides greater water certainty. And section seven, as the HCP term is 30 years, a 30 year term versus a 10 year term that um, a technical or biological opinion under section seven might be. There's no surprises uh, statement in, in our HCP. Districts won't be asked to do more <clears throat> than we've already committed to, even if there's new science or other indicators that um, says the HCP measures are enough for the species. And adaptive management provision, provisions in the HCP still allow for constructive free on changes as issues arrive. And again, going back to the drought, um, you're in our first year of implementation, you're in a historic drought, and quite honestly, there wasn't enough water for um, frogs or farmers at the time. So um, there was a lot of uh, adaptive management going on to be able to, to show that portions of the HCP were still working under these severe drought conditions while also providing water to our farmers, albeit uh, the amount of water we received um, as a junior water at Elder Basin was was uh, very low, very low. I think our lowest was uh, half a foot per acre for our sheep sheds, which normally, a normal year would be two acre feet per acre. So um, was not good. He's not good. Next slide. HCP standard of minimizing and mitigating impacts to the maximum extent practical is a higher standard than section seven. And that's uh, what Mike had mentioned earlier. Um, uh, simply avoiding jeopardy from continued existence of species. Districts are required to commit to long term efforts. Actually, we wanted a a 50 year term, but uh, services would only go uh, 30. The ongoing implementation requirements and costs, those fall on the, the HCP applicants or the committees or uh, the partners. Um, flows will increase even if conservation projects may not keep up. So in year eight, we're supposed to have 300 CFS in the river. And we've only made it to 250. That 50 CFS has to come from somewhere and it has to be in the river 
during the time specified in the HCP. And unfortunately, again, being a junior water right holder in the basin, that will fall on North Unit Area Basin District to make up that difference. During drought, the burden is heavier than in normal or wet years. I don't know if there is a thing that's normal anymore. Uh, recent shortages were effectively shared between frog farmers, but at least it wasn't uh, all or nothing for one interest. So going back to the adaptive management, that had not been the case. Fish and Wildlife Service could have said, nope, this is what you said you're going to do. This is what you're going to do. But instead, we gather around to discuss okay, if we can move water from this time period to this time period, we keep uh, more water in that reservoir than the other, um, then maybe we can make this work. But that's how we were able to get through. We stopped times was an open dialogue and again, a collaborative effort that uh, we've, we've been working under for years now, really helped uh, during three real difficult times. And then Akina's the success, um, again, building and maintaining relationships with the agencies, Warm Springs tribes, and conservation partners like Chitra Conservancy, who is a, a very active and prominent uh, group in the Deschutes Basin. And um, they all help us to address when they arise. Um, that is my last slide. And I would just say that. Um, I, um, having gone through 14 years of the HCP, wasn't easy, um, very expensive. Um, we, we had the, the video you saw with Dave Lippy was our Central Oregon Farm Fair trade show that happens every year. Um, for 14 years, we talked about the HCP, talked about what we were doing, how we were doing it. And when the HCP was signed and final, people came out of the woods like, what? You did not? Yeah. Why didn't we know? And it's like, well, this wasn't a secret. 1,500 people provided comments. And in fact, there were people that were actually sitting in court when the judge said, go back and finish the HCP, that even after that, they were astounded that we did what we did to get the HCP done. So my, I guess my end message is, if you're gonna go down this path, or really any path, um, look at the stakeholders, look at your patrons, keep them well informed, um, almost a nauseam, and uh, um, keep open and collaborative processes as best you can, recognizing that at some point, those processes need to be whittled down and uh, the people making the decisions are in the room making those decisions and not somebody else who wants. So with that, I'll turn it over to you.